I know that the theme for tonight's, uh, for tonight's conference is go big or go home. And the idea that I'd like to talk with you tonight is something that I call think big. Uh, now, I'm a history teacher, so the example I'm going to give you uh, reflect that background. So you'll have to bear with me. Uh, don't all run for the exits just yet. Uh, somebody with a microphone talking about history. Um, but I, uh, when, um, when I talk about this idea of thinking big, what I have in mind is thinking beyond those established parameters that we're usually given. And when we study history, very often it's easy to fall into that rut where we study facts, we memorize the names, the dates, the places. You guys that are in school know what I'm talking about. They're on the quizzes, they're on the exams. Uh, you are, you're, you're forced to, to reduce history into, that, uh, into the memorization and recitation of that factual information. And it has its place, but uh, the, um, uh, the problem with thinking, history, thinking about history in those terms is that it doesn't allow you the freedom to think bigger. Uh, and the, the issue that I want to uh, that I want to address with you guys tonight when it comes to thinking big is thinking about the problems that you guys face as a generation. As a generation, you guys are facing some of the problems that, uh, in my opinion, are some of the, uh, some of the biggest that humanity has ever faced. Um, you guys are going to have to wrestle with problems stemming from environmental degradation, problems stemming from climate change. You're going to have to wrestle with problems stemming from massive inequalities of wealth, not just between individuals here in the United States, but inequalities of wealth between nations. Uh, you're going to have to wrestle with the increasing scarcity of resources. And as time goes on, those resources are going to be as simple as clean water and decent food. And these are serious problems. They're huge problems. They're global in nature. And it's going to require you guys to think creatively. You're going to have to think analytically. You're going to have to think with courage. In a word, you're going to have to think big. So what I've got for you tonight are a couple of examples. Um, and uh, again, these examples come from history. And uh, um, one of the, the, uh, the first things I've got for you here is a document. Um, this is uh, a document from John Smith. You remember John Smith, Jamestown, Jamestown, Virginia, the first successful colonial settlement, North America. Anyway, uh, I don't know if you guys can read the document in the back, uh, so I'll read it for you. Uh, not long after, they took me to one of their great councils, where many of the generality were gathered in greater numbers than had ever been seen before, and they being assembled about a great field of open grass. A score of their greatest men ran out upon the field, adorned each in brightly hued jackets and breeches, with letters cunningly, cunningly woven upon their chests and wearing hats upon their heads, of a sign I know not what. One of their chiefs stood in the midst and would at his pleasure hurl a white ball at another chief, whose attire was of a different color, and whether by chance or artifice, I know not, the ball flew exceedingly close to the man, yet never injured him. But sometimes he would strike at it with a wooden club, and so giving it a hard blow, would throw down his club and run away. Such actions proceeded in like manner, at length too tedious to mention, but the generality waxed wroth with great groaning and shouting, and seemed withal much pleased. And when you read that, you have any guesses what he's talking about? He's talking about baseball, and here's where I have to admit that I purposely misled you. John Smith didn't really write this document. It was a document written by a historian trying to show one of the problems that we have when we study history, and one of those problems comes along with perspective. When we look at a document like this, our default perspective is that of the person writing the document, John Smith. But when you guys read this document, and you know he's talking about baseball, you guys know what baseball is. It's not foreign. It's not obscure, it's not bizarre to you. Foreign, or baseball is something that's it's commonplace. It's something that is familiar. So what this uh, false document does is it forces you to realize that when you're looking at a document, there is another perspective there, but a perspective that you don't often get. Now I've got another document that I want to show you, and uh, this one is a legitimate document. I'm not trying to trick you here. This is actually Christopher Columbus writing, um, this is October of 1492, if you recognize the date, this is when he lands in the New World. So here's what Columbus said. To some I gave red caps and glass beads and many other things of small value, in which they took so much pleasure and became so much our friends that it was a marvel. Later they came swimming to the ship's launches where we were, 
and brought us parrots and cotton thread and balls and javelins, many other things. And they traded them for us, or traded them to us for other things, which we gave them, such as small glass beads and bells. In some, they took everything and gave what they had very willingly. But it seemed to me that they were very poor people in everything. All of them go as naked as their mothers bore them. Some of them paint their faces, some of them the whole body, some of them only their eyes, some of them only the nose. They do not carry arms, nor are they acquainted with them, because I showed them swords, and they took them by the edge, and through ignorance cut themselves. They should be good and intelligent servants, for I see that they saw very quickly everything that is said to them, and I believe that they would become Christians very easily, for it seemed to me that they had no religion. Now, the, uh, there are at least <laughs> two glaring assumptions that Columbus makes here. Uh, the first is that the Taino Indians, it's the Taino Indians that he's referencing here, the first is that they have no weapons, no concept of warfare, and it's because they grabbed the sword of Columbus and they cut their hand. Well, as Columbus will find out, and this is, uh, other explorers will find out, the Taino have weapons, they know how to use them, they're well versed in warfare. Now, one of the other big assumptions that Columbus makes is that these Indians have no religion, and this is, this is a huge assumption. Now, Columbus comes to this assumption because he doesn't recognize, from his point of view, anything that, that is religious in nature among the Taino Indians. In reality, the Taino do have a very complex, or did have, a very complex uh, system of religious beliefs. And they focused, or this religious belief system, revolved around a series of zimis. Uh, and these zimis are... Uh, they're religious totems, they're religious icons, and they were part of rituals that the Taino Indians used in all aspects of Taino life. So when other Europeans saw Columbus's journal, they saw, oh, these uh, Taino Indians, they're going to make great Christians, we'll convert them. We have a whole slew of Spaniards who come to convert the Taino Indians, and they offer them small crucifixes, small statues of the Virgin Mary. The Taino Indians accept these as zimis and incorporate them into the Taino religious belief system. And again, this is where perspective becomes a bit of a problem. What the Taino do with these crucifixes, small statues of the Virgin Mary, they urinate on them and bury them, as they would zimis in a ritual to ensure a good harvest. Now, from the Taino perspective, that, is, that action is natural. That, that ritual is commonplace. It's, it's as familiar to them as baseball is to us. But from the Spanish perspective, their actions are anything but religious veneration. Those actions are blasphemous, and those actions result in lethal violence in response from the Spaniards. So we've got a, a problem when we're studying history. We've got a problem with perspective. And if we want to think big, we've got to expand our perspective as, as much as we possibly can to create as many possible perspectives. So now I've got one last example that I'll share with you, and it's not a document. It's actually a, uh, um, the, uh, the example that I want to give you is an event that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And this event is European contact in North America. And when the Europeans first arrived in North America, one of the things that they noted was the incredible natural bounty of things, the natural resources, the, uh, the, what they described as this pristine wilderness. Uh, off the coast of New England, lobsters were 20 pounds. In the Mississippi River, catfish were, were uh, 100 to 120 pounds. Um, the, uh, the buffalo, the bison on the Great Plains, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, herds that appeared to be limitless would stretch for 25, 30 miles. Probably the best example is one of the passenger pigeons whose populations were so huge, a single flock could take days to fly overhead. Now, the consequence of all that immense natural wealth, all that immense natural, uh, all those natural resources, is that the Europeans saw this as a place largely uninhabited, a wilderness virtually untouched by human hands. To a certain extent, that's true. We'll get back to that in just a second. But they saw this as a place of limitless bounty, where resources apparently were beyond, <laughs> beyond any sort of expiration. And what happened is a progression of 400 years of constant consumption. And we, as the cultural descendants, participated, <laughs> and we still do, in that process of consumption. 
Now, this wilderness that Europeans experienced was not always this pristine, untouched wilderness that they thought it was. And we get some of the first clues from some of the first witnesses. Um, we've got writings from Hernando de Soto. And uh, I'm sure you guys remember de Soto. He's the Spanish explorer. He's given credit for exploring what's now the southeast part of the United States. And when de Soto was exploring this region, uh, he noted uh, the in immense numbers of people that he ran across. He came across dozens of what he called cities, settlements with thousands of inhabitants the region virtually teeming with people. But about a century later, the French explorer, uh, La Salle, coming down the Mississippi River, covering some of the same territory that De Soto covered, La Salle was amazed at the absence of people. Uh, the populations were not nearly the populations that De Soto had mentioned. Similarly, when we get to New England uh, in the 1620s, the Puritans settling in, in uh, Plymouth, they recognize that there are remains of very large Native American settlements. The population seems to be much smaller than it had been. So we're left with this question, what happened? And for studying history, if we rely primarily on the traditional historical documents, this is about as far as we get. We don't really know what happened. This is where thinking big comes in. And by thinking big, if we expand what we understand as, as our traditional way of looking at the past, if we expand what we consider to be valid evidence, all of a sudden we get a much bigger picture. We get a more accurate picture, and one that has multiple perspectives, multifaceted. And the consequence is we get an image of the past that is far more compelling, one that's profoundly more interesting. So if we look at information uh, from archaeologists, from anthropologists, if we look at some of the work from uh, geneticists, from botanists, from biologists, from geologists, Here's, here's the conclusion that we get. I'll, I'll make a long story very short. There was a large Native American population here in North America before the Europeans arrived. Uh, European disease uh, arrived, and with the arrival of this European disease, about 90% of the Native population dies from exposure to the, from the disease. Now, what we also find out from looking at these various sources, we also find out that Native American population served effectively as managers of this natural environment, keeping in check all of the populations of various species throughout North America so that there was relative balance between those species. Once that Native American population was removed through disease, those species that had been kept in check now <laughs> experienced population explosions. And that's the point when we begin to see these enormous buffalo or bison herds that's when we begin to see these enormous flocks of passenger pigeons. So what the European settlers and first explorers witness is an artificial wilderness that was created by the absence of the people that had been managing that, uh, that natural environment. So what are the consequences of all of this? Well, when the Europeans arrived, they assumed that this is a pristine wilderness, that this is, this is the natural environment, seemingly limitless. And we know what happens next. The settlers embark on a path of consumption that eventually morphs into destruction. The passenger pigeons are now extinct. The buffalo became perilously close to extinction. And we'd like to think that we've learned our lesson. But we still embark on a path of, uh, of, of consumption uh, of our natural resources that is... Uh, <laughs> that, it's a rate of consumption that occurs at an alarming rate. <clears throat> now, the, um, uh, when, we, um, when we begin to think big about all of this, when we begin to think uh, in broader terms about this notion of consumption and how we arrived here, uh, one of the things that I would like for you to consider is if the Native American population had not been eradicated due to disease, if there had been substantial population that had put up a, a, a successful resistance to European conquest, would our concept of consumption and the use of resources be different? And that's a what-if question that we may never get an accurate or complete answer to. Uh, and it's one that might not necessarily help us answer these pressing issues that we have, uh, that, uh, these pressing issues that you've got facing you. 
but I do think it's an interesting idea that you might want to kick around over the dinner table, <laughs> maybe the next, uh, next big date that you've got. What I do want you to consider is when you think big, what it forces you to do is you begin to, to uh, question those cultural assumptions, you begin to question those things that you have been taught. And in this case, we begin to question the, uh, the viability of an economic system, a continually expanding economic system that is uh, based on consumption. And we begin to question if that kind of economic system is sustainable. And in this case, this is where thinking big becomes really courageous because you are challenging those established notions of what we understand as the, the principles of the culture in which we live. Now, the, uh, um, uh, the, um, this process of thinking big, although the, these are examples that I've given you that are historical in nature, my hope is, is that if you can apply these ideas of thinking big, and you use them, uh, you begin to think creatively, you begin to think analytically, you think courageously, beyond the traditional parameters that you have. What you as a generation will end up doing is essentially solving those problems that are facing us. And in the end, you'll find that you will be the generation that saves the world. Thank you. <laughs>